Thank you. So I was wondering what everyone's doing this afternoon. It's my first day back, and I'm really excited. And, and I was wondering if anyone would be willing to go hang out in Shanda Park with me. I have all afternoon free, and, and what I really want to do is just convert as many people as I can find out there. I want to convert them over to Christianity, and I want to make them members of this church. And if we're lucky to hook a couple, we can baptize them right in the river, right then, right then, right there. Anyone with me? Anyone at all? The truth is, I've got some good news for you. It's really not our sole responsibility to hook people and convert them to Christianity. Praise be to God. Instead, we have an opportunity to love and share our love with others as we learn what it means to be loved by God. We're not alone in this task. That's some other good news. We're not alone in this task. Jesus tells us he is with us till the end of our days. He is with us always. We have what it takes to be disciples of Christ. And I would bet you a dollar, many of you feel like, as you've been playing around with the evangelism part of your faith, you've thought, I don't have what it takes for that, right? I mean, not too many people want to read scripture or preach or, or be that verbose about their faith for fear of offending another person. So many times we feel like we weren't really equipped for the job that we just read in Matthew. I've been digging into this a lot, and I think there's a good reason why we don't feel equipped for that. So before we move into moving from complacency, I want to talk a little bit more about this scripture passage, how it's been interpreted through the decades, and what it means. The Great Commission wasn't found in gospel, in the gospel reading, or even, it wasn't even a term, the Great Commission, used in this context until the 1600s. At that point, it was used in Germany by a Lutheran who was moving to, um, he was a Lutheran nobleman, and, and he argued and he believed that that is what these words from Matthew 28 meant, the Great Commission. These words or this context or concept of going out and evangelizing is found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, as you know, so we've talked about this many times. If you've been with me before, each gospel has its purpose, right? The four gospels tell the story of Jesus, and they tell it a little bit differently. They all have their own purpose, and they all were written at different times. Matthew emphasizes Jesus' role as teacher and authoritative king. Mark focuses on the activity and the power of Jesus and the transfer of that activity and power to his disciples. In Luke, it shows the Lord's concern for all people and demonstrates the need all people have for forgiveness. And in John, John provides evidence for the deity of Jesus and shows what believing really means. Because part of this whole context that we're talking about in Mark, the, excuse me, in Matthew, the part that we didn't read this morning that starts at verse 16 is that just Jesus, he's the resurrected Christ among us, talking to the 11 disciples. There's 11 because, well, we know Judas is no longer with him. And it says some of them still didn't believe. They were confused. They were doubting. They didn't understand. So in each one of these texts where this takes place, this conversation, and I could give you all the numbers if you're interested, Mark 16, 14 through 18, Luke 24, 46 through 49, John 20, 30 through 31. I don't see any one of you quickly writing those down, so you can review the, you can review the video on YouTube and get those numbers. Many biblical scholars believe that these specific texts on this topic are add-ons, add-ons to the Gospels at a later time that have more to do with the practice of the early church than the exact words of Jesus after his resurrection. Of course, 
This is a debatable topic. We don't really know. But what we do know is that these four verses in the four different Gospels have been the proof text for much of the forced conversions, colonization, and other brutalities led by Christians over the last 2,000 years. And it's hard to come to terms with that as Christians. It's very hard to understand what some of our traditions have caused and what some of our forefathers and mothers have done in the name of Jesus. Some people have been so challenged by that fact that they ignore it, pretend it never happened, and carry on. Others have been so challenged by the idea of what some of us, some of our fathers and mothers and uh, Christian fathers and mothers have done that they have now refuted the whole idea of God because if God could have anything to do with that, they don't want anything to do with God and they have become atheists. But if we take a moment to learn about our history with our eyes wide open, I believe we've then taken the first step to ensure we bring forward the parts of our faith tradition that develop the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, I go back to this a lot. This is not the first time I've referred to it, and for a while I had a sticker about it on the top of my laptop. But the fruit of the Spirit, as written by Paul in the letter to the Galatians, is the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the markers of faith. These are the markers of the teachings of Jesus. But in reality, vast numbers of Christians even to this day believe that their particular interpretation of the faith is the one and only correct and exclusive path to God and those poor other sinners. If only they could accept my way of thinking, the right way of thinking, my religion, then all would be well for them and they wouldn't be rejected by God. There's a lot of people that believe that as part of their faith. But I believe God is calling us to something greater than that. We're all connected as God's creation. God has created every living thing. But sometimes, as quoted by Father Richard Rohr, the God we've been presenting people is just too small and too stingy for a big-hearted person to trust or to love back. The fact is, when we go around trying to convert people, we're immediately telling them that the way that they are isn't good enough. Mission is turned from conversion into service, and you know I have a missional heart. Service is at the heart of my ministry. I'll be leading another team to Guatemala in February. You'll be hearing more about that. Very excited. I've been leading mission teams for years. However, it's really important that when we serve as the hands and feet of the Lord, that we do so from a place of solidarity with the people we serve. That we're not seeing ourselves as above the people we serve. Because if we do that, we're keeping a superior position. If we're always the giver and the other person is always the taker, we just can't do that anymore. Every year that we go to Guatemala, and some of you here in this room have been with me, others are yet to come. Every time we learn as much as we teach, if not more. And we go and we serve with that kind of posture to learn as much as we teach from our beloved brothers and sisters, wherever they are. We meet each other wherever we are. So what does it mean then? Someone, whether it was originally written by Matthew or added in later, as some people believe, it's there in the holy canon of our faith to go and make disciples of all the nations. 
What did Jesus have in mind if, in fact, those were his words? I'm quite sure he didn't imagine what has happened in some of our Christian history. I'm quite sure we can agree on that. If we go back to Matthew 10, we'll find an interesting contradiction, in a way, to this command where Jesus is talking to the 12 disciples and sending them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and invite people to enter into that kind of life. And, and it's written, and this is the, in the Common English Bible, Jesus sent these 12 out and commanded them, don't go among the Gentiles or into a Samaritan city. Instead, go to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. It's a very surprising difference, isn't it? Jesus' vision of his message is particular to Israel. Gentiles and Samaritans were excluded from that good news proclamation back in Matthew 10. We don't know what happened between Matthew 10 and Matthew 28 that widened that scope of Jesus' vision for mission. But what if we moved away from that idea of Matthew 28, the Great Commission being about, you better convert over to Christianity or else. What if the call of the Great Commission is for the inclusion of Gentiles, or in our context, because we don't call each other that, <laughs> that means the inclusion of all creatures into the growing community of Jesus' disciples. It's that idea that's central to the case of Matthew's gospel. Making all feel welcomed and inclusive is one of, and, and included, excuse me, is one of the core themes. With that in mind, how does that reframe the Great Commission for us and inform our understanding and future of our Christian mission? And then, how do we move from complacency to action as we're trying to build community. If we look to simple, the story of the Good Samaritan, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know that story. I bet many of you know it off the top of your head. And then the teaching in Matthew 25 when Jesus says, whenever you serve the least of these, you serve me. Those two prime stories, of, and there are many others, but I chose those two because they're well known, demonstrate to us that Jesus is stretching and moving and indeed trying to stretch our meaning and practice of love and compassion. That is the great commission and the greatest commandment as we know. And I believe the church, the big church, the church with the big C, not just this church, because I think we do a darn good job of this, but the church with the big C out in the world desperately needs that better gospel message that more closely resembles lifelong witness to Jesus as a guide and a teacher, which is actually truly good news. Good news for all people, no matter their ethnicity, culture, customs, skin color, gender, or orientation. We are called to make disciples, which means we are called to include and love all creatures. And I want to challenge you, challenge each one of us to say that call to love like God loves each one of us starts with the person you look at in the mirror every day. That is the person you first need to love and love completely the way God loves you. And it, only, it is only then that you can wholeheartedly, without fear, move out to love all others. So if you look on the back of your program, for those of you at home, this will be sent to you. Uh, we'll, we'll put it out on our Facebook page. I'm sorry you don't have it. But back in August, on August 7th, while I was off gallivanting somewhere, I'm not sure what I was doing on that day, but Elaine was here preaching. And she shared with everyone a list of what it, you know, how to be a disciple. Because we talk about go and grow in your faith and yeah, yeah, that sounds great. You come to church on Sunday and I'm so excited to see you. But then on Monday you get into the grind and it's really hard to change habits, isn't it? It's very difficult. And go and be disciples, that's a really big call. 
How do you whittle that down into a bite-sized piece for yourself? How do you make it uh, something you can work towards? And, and Elaine provided some fantastic uh, steps and ideas. And in that list of steps on the back of your program that you have to take home with you and post on your fridge, put on your desk, put beside your bed, put it wherever you need to have it. I'll test you later about where you put it so that you're reading it and we know. <laughs> I'm teasing you, of course. I won't test you. But, I'll, but if you do something, like it, it gives you some great examples of how to grow spiritually yourself. Pray, read scripture, read devotions, and serve. Could you imagine, I don't know how many of you there are today, I'm not good with numbers and I can't count that fast, but if every single one of you did one act of kindness every single day, that's on Elaine's list right there, one act of kindness every day, that starts changing this community. And what if you shared that message with one other person to do one act of kindness every day? That changes this community. And the ripple effect, it makes me think of that uh, shampoo commercial, remember? And they'll tell two friends and so on and so on. Well, I'm, I'm dating myself. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Thank you. Thank you. Someone knows what I'm talking about. The fact of the matter is, go and make disciples of all the nations sounds pretty darn hard. We never felt like we were able to do that or good enough. Or what if I get the story wrong? I spent years avoiding my call and running from God because I didn't feel like I was good enough to go make disciples of all the nations. I had no idea how to do it. I mean, I'm, I mess it up. I swear. I do all sorts of horrible things. I could never do that. But God never gave up. And I was never at peace until I answered the call. I can tell you there is no greater peace than answering that call. And Elaine has whittled it down and made it really easy <laughs> to answer the call. Because to go and make disciples, you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to stand up here and preach. You don't have to sing like David. You don't have to play the banjo like Dave. You don't have to do any of those wonderful things. You just have to be you. Use the God-given gifts that you have to spread God's love in this world. That's all it takes. May it be so, my friends. Amen.